happening to all of you? Uh, sir, Amlan sir, uh, we are having uh, the participants uh, who are physically present over here. And uh, we are uh, also having the uh, participants who have joined uh, through webinar. Uh, so I welcome you all uh, for the last day of this uh, training program. Uh, so today uh, we have the talk on uh, quantum uh, search algorithms and uh, quantum error correction uh, being delivered uh, by uh, Professor uh, Amlan Chakrabarti. Uh, professor Amla Chakrabarti is uh, presently uh, the Professor and Director of uh, A.K. Choudhury School of Information Technology, uh, University of Calcutta. And additionally, he is also heading the IT and uh, Technology Innovation Cell, Department of Higher Education, Government of West Bengal. Uh, prior to this, uh, he completed his uh, postdoctoral research at uh, Princeton University. Uh, after completing his PhD from the University of Calcutta in association with uh, ISI Kolkata. Uh, he has almost 20 years of experience in engineering, education and uh, research. Uh, he has also received uh, many prestigious awards and uh, he has been uh, the principal investigator of uh, multiple projects uh, which were uh, funded by uh, various uh, ministries of uh, uh, Government of India. Uh, he has also published around uh, 200 plus uh, research papers in uh, uh, many of the refereed journals and uh, conferences uh, and he also has uh, five patents uh, to his uh, credit. His uh, current areas of uh, uh, interest are uh, machine learning, computer vision, cyber physical systems, quantum computing and uh, VLSI CAD. Uh, so my now request uh, Professor Amlan uh, to take over and uh, continue with his talks. Thanks. Uh, thanks CDAC Bangalore and uh, good morning to all of you. Thanks IEEE uh, Bangalore uh, for, for hosting me okay, for this wonderful uh, session. And I hope that uh, the participants have enjoyed the uh, the lectures at the sessions which happened in this particular workshop. Uh, so, so my my lecture today will be focusing on a very important aspect of quantum computing, uh, the quantum algorithms, and uh, then then we also look into in order to implement this quantum algorithms or design the quantum algorithms. You need to uh, know that the the, the what are the what are the challenges in the quantum system and how to overcome the challenges and that is in terms of the quantum error right so so my lecture will have two components the first part will uh, will give you a very uh, a very brief uh, okay uh, brief walk through uh, in the some of the some of the quantum quantum algorithms especially the such algorithms and uh, then i will then we'll have a small break and after the break i will again try that means again i will uh, discuss about the quantum error corrections and some of the uh, latest uh, uh, focus on how these quantum error corrections can be better achieved so let me start my presentation Uh, so I hope that uh, okay, it's perfectly visible to all of you. The title of my talk is quantum computation, okay, the algorithms, algorithms and error correction. So, so this is a very important, uh, uh, important way to connect these two, uh, because uh, because quantum algorithm, which uh, which the designers' uh, uh, job to to design the algorithm, but ultimately it has to get implemented into the quantum systems. And we also have to know that what are the best ways to implement this, uh, considering the quantum errors, right? So it's a, it's, a, it's a holistic approach or holistic knowledge you need to know for, for working with quantum computers. Okay, so, uh, so we know that at the, okay, at the beginning, I just want to highlight that uh, why quantum computing is becoming so popular, right? We know that quantum computing, okay, or rather quantum computers, exploits some of the phenomenons, okay, which are which are there in the in the sub subatomic uh, particles of matter, which the quantum computing exploits, right? To to do efficient computing. Now, uh, okay, this these properties are are like superposition, entanglement, and interference. 
which makes this paradigm of computing okay are very different from what we do in classical now what is the achievement so if when we tell that in, okay so why i tell that my computer the, the uh, quantum computing is better than the corresponding to classical computer because it gives me speed up right speed up is the speed up is the key uh, motivation to develop newer and newer computing systems okay so so essentially or quantum computing gives enough promise of the speed up and that's why it is becoming uh, so uh, so uh, okay so so popular or or so much uh, people are so much motivated uh, to to uh, to develop or to okay or to nurture these quantum systems okay now obviously it is also true that uh, it is not that all the algorithms okay if we compare its performance okay uh, okay in the quantum platform vis-a-vis -vis a classical platform it's not true that all the algorithms will have the speed up right so so but there are enough algorithms which shows a speed up okay in the form of exponential super polynomial or polynomial speed up compared to the classical counterpart okay and that and that drives the quantum computing today and that's why uh, okay from research it has also emerged as a good platform for many of the business solutions so there are enough algorithms but the pioneering ones are like the shorts factoring algorithm grover search algorithm okay uh, uh, doish algorithm right there 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 are a lot of a lot of pioneering work like uh, okay just i named and and then later on it went on and on and and now we have a large bouquet of algorithms uh, which have been established that they have uh, they can provide you the quantum supremacy i will also suggest all of you to visit a website called quantum algorithm zoo which gives you the list of algorithms and their and their uh, complexity complexity classes as well as the comparison with the best known classical algorithm that will give you a very very good understanding that what is the present platter of quantum algorithms which has been proved okay now this is again a fundamental understanding of the of the quantum computation so the power of quantum computation is towards the exascale computing right and this power comes because because quantum uh, because of the underlying quantum phenomenon the phenomenon like superposition which has been shown with a little animation here right which states that which states that that means that means in the in a in a quantum system in a closed quantum system right a particular quantum state okay a quantum state can can have a uh, Okay, it can be expressed as a superposed superposed state. What it means? It means that it's it's okay. Okay, that means we have a basis state. So so if you are going for a single qubit quantum system, right? The basis states are uh, zero and one, as it has been shown in this uh, in this particular uh, uh, okay in the slide. So so the basis states. In a single qubit system is zero and one, right? The quantum superposition enables a quantum system, a quantum state, or a single qubit quantum state to simultaneously exist in zero and one. Now, this is very, very difficult to uh, to, to visualize, right? But it's true. It's true because it's true because it is a particular state in this particular quantum system. Okay, it's a it's a particular state vector, right? In the in the state space, we have the two bases zero and one. So the state vector of this particular system have a projection on the zero basis, and also has a projection on the one basis. 
right? And that's why it is presented as a superposition alpha zero plus beta one sort of stuff, right? So, so this is on the left. I show that what is in reality, right? It's it's a right. It's always always flipping between zero and one. Okay. Now, now when we when we try to measure this superposed state, this will converge to one specific state, right? And that's and that's completely probabilistic. It's not deterministic. Okay, a single qubit which is superposed at uh, okay in the two basis states zero and one, if we try to measure this particular uh, big qubit, right? There is okay we can get either zero or either one. Right, so it's a probabilistic measurement. So, so now here, here comes a, here comes a very that is very uh, important understanding, right, in quantum algorithms. So, so provided I will show you, I will show you in my next discussion that provided you have superposition states, right, you can you can generate a large dimension, uh, okay, in the initial initial SART space. So the, so the initial SART space, you can actually cover in O1 time, right? But the, but the, but the difficulty is that, what well, the difficulty is that, you have, okay, in your, in your entire space, in a very, in a very simplified problem, you might be having only one entity, okay, which actually maps to your such oracle right so so we can so 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 we can have a large large amount of space which can be created but to but to identify the to identify the desired element right it's very difficult because all the states are equiprobable okay in the in the in the case of measurement so that's the that's that's one of the key important fact of the quantum algorithm is that how you extend okay how you do the measurement so the so the measurement process is being done after a sort of curation of the quantum states right and what is this curation this curation increases the probability of the desired state higher compared to the all other states and after this curation if you measure the quantum system, you are bound to bound to get the desired outcome because the probability of your desired state, which is which is called as mock state, is much, much higher due to this quantum curation. And most of the time, the quantum algorithmic cost is not due to the oracle, is the cost for this curation. Okay, so after running the oracle, you have to curate the quantum system in such a way that your density function of the quantum system, okay, of the desired state becomes a very highly probable compared to all other states. And so from a completely probabilistic type of outcome, using this quantum curation, which actually happens to interference and entanglement, you can go to a pseudo deterministic outcome. Right, and that is so important, and that's why that's why quantum uh, uh, that's the philosophy of how we try to visualize a quantum algorithm. Okay, so so this philosophy you should keep in mind when you are trying to design a quantum algorithm. So many of the many of the what I can say many of the uh, uh, okay okay people have a wrong concept that. Okay, if I have a have an algorithm, okay, in the classical domain, if I just use the quantum operations equivalent to the classical operations, and I convert this algorithm, it becomes a quantum algorithm. No, it's not like that. It is a quantum algorithm when you judiciously use the quantum tricks or the quantum games like superposition, entanglement, and interference in your algorithm to to uh, to make the algorithm more okay to uh, to generate the outcome of the algorithm or the desired state okay with a with a less number of uh, quantum evolutions then you have the 
then you have the real classical execution scenario. And then only you can build or then only you can establish the quantum supremacy. Okay, I will, I will, I will, I will give, give an example of this just, uh, just in my next slides. The other part of the quantum mystery or the quantum game, I call this quantum game, is the quantum entanglement. Right, so quantum, what is a quantum entanglement? It is a, it is a peculiar phenomenon which happens in the quantum domain that two particular states are very well connected. What it means that if you are doing an operation on state A, right, the, uh, the operation in the state B, B is automatically performed. On the other way, if you are measuring the state A, right, the outcome of state B can automatically be, okay, okay, can be gathered. So it is, it is, it, it is something that it is, it is something that the two states, two states are maintaining a, a maintaining a deep coherence, though they are far apart. And there are experiments that how far these two states can be, right? And it can be of that means quite a far in terms of the, uh, the actual actual physical separation. Okay. Now, now this also enables. This also enables us a great, great boost towards something called quantum communication. Though we use this in quantum circuit also in some form where the phases are affected, but the, but the, but the change in state, uh, state, okay, a particular qubit, okay, a qubit also incorporates a change, uh, a change in the qubit B in terms of the circuit, quantum circuit, but this particular quantum entanglement have a very good application in the terms of quantum communication. Well, we don't have to physically communicate the bit, but if we can entangle the bit, whatever we are doing in the side A, it will be known in the side B in some way. Okay, so it's a it's a it's a communication to the entangled qubits. Okay. Uh, now to now to get into this quantum algorithms, right? Obviously, there there is an another version of the quantum algorithms, which are called the quantum annealing type of algorithms which I am not covering here. The algorithms what I'm covering here are basically the quantum gate based uh, gate algorithm. That means the, the algorithms which can be defined in terms of quantum operations or quantum gates, right? So, so obviously when we try to try to express our quantum algorithms, okay, like the classical algorithm, we, in a classical algorithm, we express our algorithms in terms of some data operations. Similarly, when we try to express our quantum algorithm, it should be defined in terms of some logical quantum operations. And these logical quantum operations may be very high level, okay, which needs to be decomposed into okay, quantum gates. And then further, it, it will be decomposed into a sort of quantum primitive operations, which are the very, very basic quantum gates. Now, there is a there is an issue here. The issue here is that the, the basic quantum gates, okay, is again technology dependent. But this, 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 this has been worked out by our group when, okay, at Princeton, uh, okay, long ago in 2000, uh, uh, okay, 10, 10 to 12, 11 to 12, okay, we have shown very, very well that that how the how the cost of the algorithms okay how the how the cost of the algorithms vary with the technology so why this is a why this variation because you have to understand that the 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 logical operations needs to be needs to be ultimately transformed into into some physical quantum operations and physical quantum operations are very are only single qubit operations of the poly Poly operations or two qubit operations like control C naught and control Z Z operations, C naught and C Z operations. Higher operations, higher qubit operations are not directly supported by technology. So what do you need to do? You need to do quantum synthesis, which I I am not getting into this particular lecture, but this is a very a very uh, interesting topic, and this is the domain where I work for maybe for the 
for 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 four to five years, including my PhD and the early part of my postdoc at Princeton. So so this is also a very important important aspect, and still and still this work is very valid because as the technology is getting changed, right? As the as the as the quantum functions are getting changed, right? So how you can how you can map the high level quantum functions to the intermediate quantum operations and to the primitive quantum operations which are technology dependent okay and so the quantum circuits and quantum gates have a very long uh, effect on how this quantum algorithm will be implemented okay what i what i say here is that some of the very preliminary uh, or the basic basic quantum gates right which are single qubit gates like this right hadamard pauli gates uh, okay and the phase gates at T gates, uh, right, and there are and there are and 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 there are some two qubit gates, okay, right, or or maybe three qubit gates, like 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 Toffoli. Remember again, again, I'm coming back to this. Remember that present technology doesn't doesn't allows you to do a quantum operation, okay, higher than two qubit operations, okay, so. So any operations in the logical in the, in, in the logical description, you can have a larger dimension of this of this control not get, which is called M M C not gets multi control not gets. But ultimately, all these gates, all these high level gates, needs to be decomposed into uh, two qubit, two qubit, and 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 single qubit gates. And there are standard decomposition algorithms like Sol Vekitaev and others. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, so 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 I can take a question if it is if it is there up to this point of time. I can I can I can just have a couple of questions if there are any. Or we will take the question after the after this part, whatever is uh, is fine with you. So uh so is there any way that I can take questions now or, or I will take the questions after the talk? Uh, so right now, uh, we don't have any questions. You can carry on. Probably they might come at the end. So, uh, so let me now move on to the, the quantum algorithms and, uh, and it has been proved or or it has been shown that the uh, quantum algorithms are very strong, right, in solving the problems which are related to the search, search problems. Okay, so quantum search algorithms are very, are very, uh, uh, very going very strong, right? In that sense, right? It started from the the algorithm of the, okay, of Grover. Right and and it and it went on and on, right, so I will I will just capture a bit of this journey from the Grover to the next next series of algorithms to the to the uh, okay to the uh, random walk search okay. So, uh, so as I said, it has a uh, it has shown immense potential in speed up compared to classical counterparts. Okay. Uh, so. So non-deterministic polynomial polynomial problems in the classical domain, right? So 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 those who know that there is something called uh, BQP. I don't have that particular slide here, but there is a, a, a complexity class called BQP complexity class. So BQP comp complexity class actually extends the P class P class in the classical domain, the polynomial class of algorithms. And and it covers covers the NP class, okay, to a great extent. So what it means is that that means some of the NP algorithms becomes polynomial algorithms in the in the quantum space. But 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 what is the B? B means the bounded error. So what is this bounded error? So bounded error means, okay, okay provided you have a certain certain error buffer okay you can solve the problem so so it is so why did it comes because because quantum algorithms are not exact 
okay it's 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 uh, it's not exact right and and the and the, the okay much you relax in terms of your uh, talk okay okay of your outcome right you might cover okay much larger space of the problem okay so 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 that's why it's called a bounded error means the uh, means the error what you can actually okay that allow right or you can consider based on that the convergence of the algorithm will happen okay and this convergence will ex extend the class of p and will cover some and, and will cover the domain of np and will bring that into the purview of the quantum polynomial class okay so that's 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 the that's the that's a very 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 important uh, uh Okay, fact, what happens in the quantum algorithms, okay? In the case of search, the Grover's algorithms, which is phenomenon, and as well as quantum random walk algorithms, which have also come up in a great way uh, to, to, uh, to sort out or to solve many problems in the, in the, in the which is to the search algorithms. So now this is a, this is a very simple, uh, simple uh, visualization of what uh, is a Grover's algorithm. Okay, so 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 what happens in the Grover's algorithm is that Grover's algorithm tries to tries to find an element, okay, in a completely unordered list, and the and the search criteria means um, means the truth of the search. Is being provided by an oracle. Okay. So, <clears throat> so what it is it means that it means that that means you that you provide me a list, okay, of items, and in a simplistic case, one item will match my search criteria, right? And at the at the outcome, when I measure my system. I will get that particular outcome or, or that particular element out of all the elements. And that is that, that which means that I have, I have, I have searched, uh, I have got my searched element as at the output. Now, you know how it starts. So this is very important to understand the initialization. So, so in the classical, in the classical domain, Okay, the initialization means that how you initialize, okay, or 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 how you how you put the input, okay, to your system, how you offer the input to your system. Okay, so so as such, initialization for an unknown set of elements for an unknown uh, element of data doesn't make any sense. In that sense, because you are just giving an unknown data uh, to your system, and the system will try to check whether the data matches the search criteria or not. Right. So, so in the classical system, if you are having a list of n elements, but in the worst case, you have to search all the elements. So, what you need to do, you need to, okay, that is, you need to pass pass all the elements one after another. Okay, to the to the to the search oracle right and the search oracle will actually have in the worst case will have n calls because each element for each element you need to need to call the oracle function once in the case of classical okay now in the case of quantum right you can do a much better way because quantum supports superposition. So what you do here, instead of representing each element individually, you can represent all the elements of your list as a superposed quantum system, superposed quantum state. So how it works, that if you have n number of elements in the list, you can represent each element, you can represent the, uh, uh, those element with a superposition of log two base n number of qubits. Because 
because uh, okay n qubits represent two to the power n states so capital n number of states can be represented by log 2 base n number of quantum bits or qubits so that is the initialization and normally we initialize the bits with zero and then we apply a superposition operator which is called a hadamard operator and we generate a superposition state like this this means a superposition of states from zero to capital n minus one okay now now what happens now the oracle comes into the between so what oracle does for all the superposed states the oracle works simultaneously in o1 and what it does the the oracle is built purposeful in such a way that for all the superposed states what i offer to the oracle one state one state will be marked and this marking is in the normal sense is done by the phase inversion so what i get is that i get that that all all of this all of this uh, okay, out of all of these superposed states only one state has gone for a phase inversion right and that is something like this operation so you see that only one state which may be an m out of zero out of zero to n minus one okay i have the mth state which is being marked as a which has been marked as a as a uh, flipped which phase has been flipped is being isolated as 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 minus alpha m right and and all others and all others which are okay, which are from zero to, to n minus one uh, okay uh, okay ex, ex, okay accepting the image state are being taken as a as a okay are not being marked right and this is a this is a very important activity which has been done by the oracle and you have to build the oracle in that way so that it can be achieved it can do a phase inversion of the state for which the oracle generates true value now the quantum game now the next quantum game is that how we can amplify this particular state because because if we try to do a measurement here then as all the all the amplitudes of all the states are same amplitude of all the states are same right you can you can you can okay you can come up to any of these states so you cannot do measurement here at, at just after this particular step where you have marked this particular element so now what you need to do you need to do a quantum game and this quantum game is a sort of quantum amplitude amplification now what this quantum amplitude amplification does in a very simplistic way is that it tries to tries to tries to subtract each of the states from its mean so so if you sub subtract each of the state from its mean what will happen is that what will happen is that this particular uh, this particular state which is a negative okay oh, okay this particular have a negative will actually reduce the mean to a little bit compared to each of the states right and this once we subtract this it will check that all the positive amplitudes are getting much much reduced whereas the negative amplitude getting increased okay it's called the it's called the uh, taking the mean and subtracting the mean from all the states okay so this process can continue for some iterations and then you will get a very good uh, the amplitude of the negative for the marked state is much much higher than all of the states and this is a sort of interference also uh, 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 the subtracting something okay 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 right and adding adding to something in a quantum state is basically called destructive interference and constructive interference in a destructive interference the particular amplitude goes down and in the constructive interference the, the the amplitude increases so so this this is being done by an operator called grover's diffusion operator okay which actually does this particular to the particular state 
and 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 you get a good distribution uh okay of the of the of the all all of the quantum states and then if you measure this then if you measure this this quantum system or the quantum outcome will will converge to this particular state where the probability is much much higher because the uh, because because the because the probability of the outcome is 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 proportional to the square of the amplitude okay so so as the amplitude of this state is quite high compared to the other states right this particular okay that is in the in this in the in the uh, measurement this particular state will be much much probable than others okay so this is the this is the, the this is a conceptual uh, visualization of what Grover's algorithm does and this is and this is the so this is the okay the operations which are being used to perform this uh, to perform this and this this particular operation is called a Grover's operation okay and this is uh, the, this is a very simple a simple so this particular this particular operation actually does the subtraction the subtraction with the mean okay and that is called a, a Grover's diffusion operation in a in a okay in total okay uh, so now using this using this Grover's search right what are the algorithms you can solve okay there are plenty of algorithms which we can solve in the Grover's using this using this Grover search operator so so what we will do we will take this Grover search operator as a as a module in our so so that so the target of the global search algorithm is that given a given a state okay okay given a uh, okay a given a uh, yeah that given uh, some number of states right and given an oracle oracle right and the Grover search will generate an outcome for which for the state for which the oracle is true okay due to this inherent uh, okay uh, the property of the Grover's uh, Grover's algorithm or or, or Grover's uh, search function okay so uh, so let's try to understand that what is the, how we can use this Grover search operator okay so so very interesting problem from the graph it's called a k coloring problem and the k coloring problem is an np complete problem so what is this problem this problem states that given a set of graph nodes connected with a set of edges right you have to choose k number of colors to color the nodes such that no adjacent nodes will get the same color Okay, I hope I have. It is it is pretty clear what I have tried to try to do, uh, try to define this problem to all of you. Okay, so so the problem states that suppose I have arbitrarily colored my my graph nodes, whether I can guarantee that this graph coloring satisfies the k coloring problem. The satisfaction of the k coloring problem means that I have to that is, I have to uh, uh, say, say, or I have to check that whether all the adjacent nodes are having the distinct color. Okay. Now, now obviously, the second part of the problem is that can we can we reduce that for a given graph? Can we generate the minimum value of the k? That is again a very, that is actually an NP hard problem in that sense. So, so, so what it means that, that is I also have to test that whether this, this, this number of colors is the minimum number of colors which can color this graph obeying the K coloring problem, K coloring problem definition. Okay. Now, Now, what we can do do in this particular 
a particular operation okay is that we can uh, we have okay this is uh, this is one of our work where we have developed our uh, developed the grover's oracle for the k coloring problem okay so so this this is the grover's oracle because because you will see that there is a flip in the phase okay okay there is a flip in the phase of the of uh, okay, what we what we try to uh, try to measure okay so, so what we do in a very simplistic way i'll try to explain the problem what we try to do here is that we try to we try to color a particular graph okay we encode the nodes in terms of the qubit right and we also encode the colors okay so so if we have k colors right we need to encode the k colors using log 2 base k qubits and if you have n nodes okay for for n nodes we require n qubits okay so 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 we encode the qubits as well as encode the colors right right and this and this is co comes on the qubit activation okay how we how we encode this now this invalid color detector what it tries it tries to it tries to identify that when we suppose we have a uh, okay say 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 we define uh, okay capital n number of colors now this capital n number of colors colors okay, and we have suppose small n number of nodes okay so we know that okay we know that to to uh, to define capital n number of colors we require log 2 base capital n number of qubits okay but but maybe we are not selecting capital n number of colors we are selecting much less than number of colors okay so so it might happen that when we try to use the log two base capital n number of qubits represent the colors some of the colors are not being utilized or not required okay so so those colors will be defined as an invalid color right and there is a there is a mechanism okay by which we can do that okay right and then and then the comp comparator comes the the way the comparator works is basically it tries to compare the two adjacent nodes okay it tries to compare the two adjacent nodes that whether these nodes have the same color or not if they have the same color right then we then we don't have this activation we have the all the zeros if they have the different color then only this is marked this particular ancilla qubit is marked right and we know that this particular okay this particular cube this particular adjacency has has actually generated generated the followed the k coloring problem definition okay and this we need to perform between all the all the nodes this we need to perform between all the nodes to actually generate their generate their results and if we if we are satisfied with that we can actually uh, okay uh, okay say that these are these are obeyed the k color now in order to understand whether this is a minimum k coloring problem so what we can do we can go on reducing the value of k by one and we can see that see that ultimately whether those colors satisfies this so so where this where we will where we will say that the k coloring problem is the the k coloring problem is not being considered here when we find that when we find that the adjust in the the initial distribution of k colors what we have taken initial distribution of k colors what we have taken right we we are unable to we are getting at least one one set of nodes in adjacents which have which have the same color so if they have the same color then we are not satisfying the k coloring problem then we have to increase the value of the k if we see that for a current value of the k right this is solved then we can go into the 
k minus one value of the of the of the color and then and then we will see if we have a k minus one value of the color then we will actually this invalid color detector will work because you have to reject one color from your list so this is the entire algorithm right i will give the reference of this uh, but this was published in 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 our springer springer nature computer science journal very recently uh, so this is yeah so this is the this is the this is one of the uh, okay uh, good algorithms which uh, which have been developed and and which uses a sort of rover search okay so these are the this is the comparator uh, the comparator circuits for a two qubit and a four qubit you can get into uh, okay the paper and you can check uh, okay that means and you can again okay, you can know the actual, actual logic how they have done okay so so not only this comparator so so our contribution in this work was the comparator building the comparator circuit and also to define the problem of k color in, in the in the quantum setting such that we can actually not only get into the k coloring satisfaction we can also go to the minimum k now now similarly that means another another important problem in the graph domain is a k click problem so the k click problem tells that whether whether we can have a connected path between k k vertices in a graph if we can have a connected path between the k vertices of a graph then we can say that this is this has a click size of k so the click size of, of of three is a very common problem called triangle finding problem and we have click size of four five something like that okay so so here also we have defined a sort of oracle function okay actually the comparator what we designed in the in the in the previous algorithm was a uh, was the oracle right and similarly we designed a sort of oracle function here which is called an edge oracle here right and this edge oracle tries to okay tries to compute with the adjacency data of the graph and tries to and tries to mark the uh, uh, okay tries to mark the the ancillary qubits okay if the edge are present or not okay and 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 then if we get the edge from the node one to two then we try to edge from the node Two to three, and then we try to find the node from edge three to one. Okay, so 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 this way, this way, if we can, if we can get it right, we can try to uh, try to do that. So so we do a do a sort of qubit activation, which represents the the graph nodes and the edges. Uh, okay, in terms of the qubits, right, and then we try to then we try to search the uh, okay search the edge edge. Uh, uh, whether the edges are present between the between the set of uh, the set of quantum nodes in the in the qubit uh, search space and try to develop this particular edge detection uh, okay block and uh, and and we and we iterate to uh, to uh, to uh, to the steps so that the, all the all the edges are ultimately covered okay so so this approach also has okay has a we have defined a sort of oracle which is called a click detector oracle right and this big detector oracle in a in a in a in a in a nutshell is something like this okay which actually uh, okay goes to goes to each of the nodes but defines an edge detector uh, uh, function right an edge detector function is true or false depending on whether the edge is present in the adjacency data or not okay and tries to and tries to flip this particular uh, a particular ancilla okay Okay, okay. Flip this particular ancilla, okay, which actually tries to uh, tries to define. Okay. Okay. So 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 this flipping. Once we flip this, right, we can actually use the Grover's uh, okay Grover's algorithm, Grover's amplitude amplification to 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 uh, to record this particular okay to record this particular. Uh, um, Okay, to record this particular state that whether whether we have found the click or not. Okay, so so the k click means you have to iterate this for k number of times. Okay, so that you can you can you can find the the connectivity between 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 the nodes. Okay, right, and this also uh, okay, this also that means we have actually uh, okay sorted this algorithm which uh, with with a very very um, uh, a very good 
reduced number of the qubit uh, cost, okay, qubit cost in terms of the click size, okay. Uh, so, so what I described until now are the are the algorithms which can which can warp, okay, is in the Grover search, okay, the search search algorithms are based on the Grover's operator. Now, uh, now what we are, now what I am, the, I will, I will discuss is, is a different type of approach in the quantum domain, which is called the quantum random walk. Though there are two types of random walk, the, the discrete and the quantum random, uh, is the continuous time random walk. To, to get into this understanding, let's try to get a very, a very brief overview that what is a random walk and random walk is there in the classical domain also. Now, how the classical domain random walk differs from the quantum domain random walk, right, is given by a very small illustration at the right side of the of this of this slide. So, if you look at the classical random walk, right, you actually move to the states, right, in a in a in a in a way depending on okay okay in the neighborhood in a particular uh, uh, single step. But these are these are these are all done in a classical you do a single step right and you try to try to traverse the entire search space the search space is represented by this uh, by the structure and you are doing a random walk on the search space now now the random walk in a two sense means you don't have a predetermined direction right you can you can you can go anywhere okay in the classical case and wherever you go, you can you can call and okay call and uh, call an oracle function, and you can and you can try to see that whether this particular state is your desired state or not. So the so the way we do a very procedural search, and the way we do a random search is that in a procedural search we go by a go by a particular logic, right? But 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 it is a guess that. The, there's a Markovian uh, model. It suggests that the, if we do random search, maybe we can hit hit the desired state faster than what we can do with a procedural search. Okay, very 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 very, very okay very, very simplest uh, okay or a or a sequential type of search. Now the difference between the classical and quantum search is that in the quantum, as we have superposed states. In each movement, you can cover more number of steps, more number of states rather, sorry. In each step of the search, you can cover more number of steps, right? And so what you can do with a less number of steps, you can cover all the steps because you have a superposed, uh, superposed way of moving into the graph, into, into, into the search state. So you see that. So you see that the step in the in the in the step two, you can actually cover two states. In the step three, you can cover the all the all the neighbors of this of this state simultaneously, because all these states can work simultaneously, right? And you can cover the cover the graph. You can cover the search space in a much lesser amount of time called the hitting time of the of the of the graph. Okay. So so when you when you do this operation in the quantum domain, right? It is uh, okay. The Hilbert Hilbert space is the is the okay is the space where the quantum operations are done, right? And Hamiltonian is the quantum state evolution. So these two terms are very very significant. You have to understand, right? So so actually actually any any quantum quantum operation, okay, is an Hamiltonian is a is a is a is a Hamiltonian transformation, which actually evolves from state state A to state B, quantum state psi one to psi two, and and this evolution is actually being acted upon in the quantum gate space by the quantum operators. Okay, so okay, so the transformation is done by the quantum operations, and the transformations are guided by the rules of the Hilbert space. Okay, so. <coughs> So this particular evolution in this in this random walk domain, right, is being is being driven, is driven by two 
uh, two important phenomena. One is called the position operator, okay, and 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 another one is called the coin flip operator. So so it means that the coin flip operator defines the probabilities of the positions what you are going to acquire in the next iteration. So in each iteration, you flip the coin and you determine the probability and you set the new positional uh, positional values, right? That means where where you move, okay? And, 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 and then what happens is that this coin, this coin is the actual trick. So what happens here is that if you can if you can tweak the coin if you can choose a proper coin then what happens okay the position where you have found your search true this position this position can be can be amplified this position state can have a higher amplitude where the search is true compared to the positions okay where you find the search is false and when you measure the system, when you measure the system, you will converge to that particular position where your uh, where your search is true, because the probability, because because the way you have processed the search is that the amplitude have added for that positional state higher, and and uh, and uh, the other positional states have gone lower in the amplitude. So when you measure the entire system, you will get that particular state. Uh, state with a much higher probability, and that was your resulting state. Okay. It has been proved that the DTQ tableau, which is called a discrete time, the, 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 although there's a continuous time random walk also, but the discrete time quantum random walk has a has a uh, has a space quadratically faster compared to the classical space. Okay. So so now how we implement this? So so the positions in your SART space are encoded as the quantum states, okay, like the simple encoding we have done, okay? So, 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 so you may have, you may have uh, zero to seven, the okay, positional states, and you encode them using, okay, using the quantum uh, okay, qubits, right? You require log uh, two base seven qubits to, to do this, okay? So, so this is the way how we do it, and 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 right, and then then comes the coin, then comes the coin operator. So coin operator determines that how the movement will be mapped, how you how you, what are the, what are the probabilities of of the movement to these states. Okay. So so a simple movement, a simple movement can be a, a simple permutation, right? How you can move from zero zero to 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 zero zero one and this so so what we can have we can have the also the if it is a linear work if it is a linear work we can take that here this is zero and then we can one two three four in the in the in the right and then we got minus one two three four five in the left right and then you can entirely encode this encode this particular space with a with a, with a random walk on the line okay right and this is the example given here now now, so the mapping, so the mapping probability, okay, from okay, from a particular uh, state to a particular state, right? It depends by the coin operator. Okay, so the coin operator adds a bias or adds a weight, okay, to moving, okay, moving the amplitude from a particular position to its nearby position, okay, to the nearby adjacent positions. Now, now what can be done further is that from this particular what we have discussed till now is a binary quantum computation now these these search algorithms especially in the in the in the case of random walk as we need to cover a larger space it can also be worked upon on the ternary ternary means the basis states are 0 1 and 2 okay in the binary quantum system the basis states are 0 and 1 in the ternary quantum systems that the basis states are zero one and two so if we do the zero one and two basis states you have to a little bit modulate on the on the on the on the on the coin operators and the positional operations because they are now ternary but it has been seen that the 
number of resources you require, the number of ternary qubits you require, and the number of steps you can go ahead is much increasing in the case of ternary quantum system than case of binary quantum system. So it has been it has been well proved that ternary quantum systems can give you a much faster result in the random walk problems so compared to the binary. But the challenge is that the ternary quantum technology is still very niche. Binary quantum technology has, has improved a lot, but provided the ternary quantum technology or further multivariate quantum technology also comes up in the next few years, this random walk problems on those multivariate logic can be a much stronger algorithms, okay? So, so when we try to do this, right, we have to also, not only we need to think in the ternary or the multi-qubit system, we also have to think the operators in the multi-qubit system. And the, and the very important operator in, the, in this particular random walk is the, is the, is the, is the Toffoli operator. So, so, so how we can define the Toffoli operator in the multi-qubit system Starting from ternary to quaternary and and the dr dinary dr systems, uh, okay. This is obviously a good work to to do, right? And we have and we have done done some work on that particular domain where we have tried to uh, synthesize uh, synthesize a ternary synot ternary Toffoli operator to its equivalent, uh, uh, okay, two q dit, okay, two q dit operators. Right, and so that it can be synthesized and it can be implemented. And we have also also found that there are technologies now that are available, though they are very niche, but technologies are available in the iron trap where we can implement this particular type of uh, type of operators. And and going ahead further, right, we have also shown in one of our papers that we can have a mix of we can have a mix of qubit and qubit, right. Right, exploring the full advantage of this of this systems of this of this quantum SART space abstraction, right? It can perform a really a very good, uh, a very good way, or uh, uh, get it, okay, gives us an immense immense speed up in the computation. So maybe so maybe the the next generation quantum systems, so the quantum SART algorithms, provide the technology support is there. Can be built with the systems which are employing both qubit and qubit type of quantum operations. So I'm not getting into this. These are uh, okay. These are these are the these are the decompositions and these are the circuits. Grovers we have recently come up with our ACM transaction paper where we have defined the Grovers algorithm in the qubit space in the generalized qubit space. Okay. So so these are the what I tried to say. What I, what I tried to uh, uh, discuss with you all here is that starting from the Grover, okay, a lot of things can be taken care. Still, still we can we can exploit Grovers to to many more algorithms. But if you are getting into a new direction, you can look into this algorithms, uh, such algorithms in the in the domain of random walk, right? And you can do the traditional uh, uh, discrete time random walk. I didn't cover the continuous time random walk. Continuous time random walk is also there. And then you can move on to the next level of systems, which is called the QDIT type of systems, where you can have a much, much smaller heating time in this in, in this random work domain. And maybe maybe we can look forward to uh, to the qubit QDIT combination in this type of algorithms, both in terms of Grover search and in terms of this uh, okay, of these algorithms, okay, of this of this random work algorithms. So, so I think I can. I can end up the session one here, uh, which gives you the uh, what I discussed about the search algorithms and the trends in the search algorithms, so that the new researchers can look into this work and can uh, okay, try to uh, okay, try try to go farther from here. Okay. So uh, so the first part of my lecture is done. I can take a uh, a brief break, maybe five or ten minutes, and then I can move to the next discussion on the quantum middle. Uh, hello, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Regarding this session, I have two questions. Can we take sure. up uh, those sure. questions, sir? Sure, sure, okay. sure, sure. sure. Uh, Miss Miss Divya N S. She is asking, 
does the communication between entangled quantum particles is faster than the speed of light? Uh, it shouldn't be faster than the speed of light uh, because uh, uh, okay, because I don't know whether that violates the theory. But uh, but uh, but I think the more that is the the major objective in quantum entanglement is actually maintaining the correlation in the measurement uh, between the between the two particles because normally when we tell that we are moving the particles it's a sort of teleportation of the uh, of the quantum uh, states uh, right and and the, okay and the communication between the entangled entangled particles uh, Okay, that means I I don't uh, uh, I can't say the whether there is greater than the speed of light because uh, that is not the not the major oct objective in entanglement. Yeah, thank you. But when you look into the technology, what's the current technology of this quantum entanglement, and you can look that whether there yeah, there are there are studies or there are experimental reports which can say that this can be done. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, one more, uh, this is from Ms. Jyoti. She is asking uh, circuit design for K coloring problem and its implementation on near near term quantum devices. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So, so this was our, uh, this was our work actually. So, so I have defined the problem. So what is meant by the K coloring problem here? What we tried to propose here is that, uh, suppose we have colored a graph. Okay, and k number of colors. So now, first of all, we have to prove that this coloring, this coloring is satisfied the k coloring problem, right? So, so for that, what we have used, we have tried to, okay, tried to uh, okay, use a comparator circuit, and we have try tried to encode the colors, right, and the, and the qubits, right, and we have and we have checked that whether the whether the qubits qubits in the adjacent okay they they are actually let's say having having different colors color values because color values are also encoded right so that checking is done by the comparator and and then we and then we have defined a function which flips the state uh, okay if the color values are different right and doesn't flip the state if the color values are same so that is the, that is done with a Hadamard. So if we mean the Hadamard means if we if we flip the state, it becomes a, a from the a from the zero zero plus one, it becomes a zero minus one, right? And then you can and then you can actually measure all this using the using the Grover, and you can tell that hey, this is uh, this has uh, this has this has obeyed the obeyed the k-color problem. Now. Now, further to this is that we can actually that we have thought extending the algorithm in that sense that okay, if we reduce the value from k to k minus one, if it still satisfies, and this way we can actually go go to the minimum k, right? And that's the, the that's the way we can actually go. So the so the near near term near term the near term quantum computer means that we are actually trying to. Okay, trying trying to use the use the use the noise with the NISQ type of quantum computers. Okay, where where we cannot just do a single measurement, but we have to do a repeated measurement, right? And we can and we can decompose the problem into some smaller problems, right? And we can try to converge it. Okay, so so that's the that's the philosophy here. <laughs> Yeah, Dr. Jyoti, if you, uh, if I've satisfied your question. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, from participants, uh, from physically here, do you have any questions? No? Yeah, please, sir. Uh, good morning, sir. Yes. Uh, over to implement machine learning algorithms in this quantum circuit. Can you be a bit loud? Uh, how to implement uh, machine learning algorithms in this quantum circuit? What the, the, the? How, how to implement these uh, machine learning algorithms okay, on quantum okay. computers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this is also a very good question. We have, we have, uh, we have recently. I, 
I have not uh, discussed this uh, this work. We have actually recently implemented not a machine learning algorithm, but a but a soft computing algorithm, which is called a swarm swarm optimization. So the so the philosophy of of implementing implementing the quantum algorithms in this uh, in this domain is something like that. Say, uh, it's, it, that was, uh, there are two ways. One is straight away. Straight away, you can think of the quantum neural networks. Okay. Uh, which are coming up in a great way, okay? Uh, where we are, where we are trying to, okay, trying to see the 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 uh, the connectivities between the neurons, right, and the neuron states, okay? Can we okay, can we define in terms of a quantum system? This is one of the activity. Another activity is that we have several types of error functions which we need to optimize, right? In using in this in this classical uh, classical machine learning algorithms. In these optimizations, we can use quantum algorithms. So this is a classical quantum hybrid algorithms, where where we actually do the training, uh, okay, training in the classical domain, but to optimize this, optimize this training, we use the quantum formulation so that we can have the better optimization of the parameters, right, and we can have the training faster. So, so there are two ways you can do. Though there are, having said that, there are quantum versions of SVM. Okay, there are quantum versions of random forest that people have come up with. Uh, those you have to look into, right? We have in our group, we have actually, uh, that is, as I was saying, we have recently come up with a paper called Quantum Ant in the in the quantum, okay, IET Quantum Communication Journal last year, and that was. That was novel in the sense because that was the that is still 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 dead. The algorithm which actually works entirely on the quantum. So in the case of quantum and okay, right? We have a we have a such and then we have this uh, th this annihilation of the pheromone, right? Annihilation of the pheromone concentration of the pheromone. So we have implemented a a quantum pheromone box. Right in that particular paper, that means if you if you connect me after the lecture through email, I will pass you the paper. So we have we have first we have implemented that particular quantum uh, quantum toolbox or or a quantum box, uh, okay, for this pheromone deposition and annihilation, annihilation, okay, which uh, which is a soft computing algorithm. So so in the optimization domain, many of these machine learning algorithms requires optimization. So to opti for optimization, you can directly use quantum algorithms, uh, okay, and you can tell it's a quantum classical hybrid algorithm for machine learning. The other approach is directly implementing into the quantum uh, machine learning, like quantum SVM, QSVM, quantum random forest, quantum neural network is coming in a great way, right? And these are the directions in quantum machine learning. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, can we break for 15 minutes? Perfect. We can get for 15 minutes. So, so now the time in my watch is, is, is 11, 11, 15. 15. We will cover 11.30. Perfect. Yes. Uh, sure. We'll uh, re, uh, meet uh, again. Uh, we'll start the session at 11.30. Perfect. 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 Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much, sir. Sure. Sure. Thank you.
is that yeah that means what we have what we have covered in the first part of my lecture is that very uh, uh, very interesting uh, okay, progress in the domain of quantum algorithms especially the search algorithms right and and we have uh, seen certain manifestations of those now we get into okay something which is more towards the the implementation so so when we when we look into the implementation, right, right, obviously we know that quantum has a decoherence. Quantum states decohere. So decohere means that the, that the quantumness of the state, okay, decays with time, right? And, and when we are uh, doing this quantum gate operations, right, and these operations are done on the quantum registers, right, after, after, certain, after a certain intervals. Okay, so so the registers hold these quantum states, and and obviously that is if we if we do if we do a uh, some number of gate operations, right? Some number of gate operations. Okay, the uh, okay the, the okay as the as the as the time enhances, right? The quantum quantum state of the registers can decohere. The other part of this problem is that the quantum gates what you are operating, right, they itself can generate errors. Okay, so there are two two ways. There is called quantum memory error and quantum gate error. So quantum gate error in a sense is that when we do gate operations, the gates are also not perfect. Okay, they can induce certain certain errors. And quantum memory operators, uh, uh, memory errors means that when the quantum state in the quantum registers, they itself decohere with time. So, uh, so this makes this makes. So, what are the challenges now in this? If we if we if we consider this perspective of quantum system, the challenges in hand what we have is that we we have to. Uh, Okay, the scalability of the system is at a question. Okay, because because if you are trying to trying to work on a large qubit register or a or a or a uh, okay or a large quantum volume, we now say quantum volume. But what's the guarantee? What's the guarantee in terms of fidelity of the quantum system? Okay, that means what's the guarantee that it will not be error prone? High, much much more error prone than a small scale quantum system. Right, and that is in some case true, right? In a in a in a very thumb rule way, we can always say that if you are if you are working on a smaller size quantum system, right, this will have less effect compared to okay in terms of error compared to a quantum system which is very large. Okay, and that's the challenge. The second challenge is that hey, can we really build up the complex quantum operations? Because complex quantum operations means more number of quantum gates. And more number of quantum gates means get error, and as well as it's a it's a longer longer quantum operation, so it will be it can induce both the gate errors as well as the quantum memory errors. So this this seriously restricts the uh, the scalability of quantum systems. Though though the though the error is again dependent on the technology on which we are trying to work. We had studied some of the technologies, okay, right, and we have seen that some of the technologies are susceptible to 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 error more compared to other technologies, okay. Now, now in terms of a quantum designer, algorithm designer, and the and the quantum circuit designer, what are the paths we can take so that so that we can actually reduce this effect of errors, right? And that are the strategies which are being considered in the quantum algorithm design. Okay, so that it is it is it is a sort of uh, error error reduction. So so we design it such a way, or, or okay, such a way the quantum algorithms and map it to the circuits in such a way such that the quantum errors are inherently reduced. Okay, and now you know if we can do that, then only we can 
Well, we can actually have, uh, have a scalable system. The other, actually, this is very difficult proposition that is reduce the quantum error in an algorithmic way or quantum circuit way is a little bit challenge. The, the standard practice in this process is that a reduction of error is that can we detect and correct errors, which is which comes under the purview of the quantum error correcting codes or any error correcting codes. If we see the classical also, the classical error correcting codes are redundant, redundant bits, which are added to message bits. So that in the receiver side, we can we can actually try to detect the errors. And if possible, if we can detect the exact syndrome, we can correct the errors too. Okay. <clears throat> so, so whether those type of mechanisms can also come up in the quantum domain, and that tells uh, tells a new direction, which is called quantum error correction. Okay. So, so why quantum error correction? Now, having said this quantum error correction, what are the challenges? The first challenge, no cloning principle. Means you can tell that, okay, what we can do, we can before, before, before there's an error, we copy the quantum state, right? And preserve it. So that if error happens also, the quantum state is preserved and we can operate it later. But it is not possible. You cannot copy or you cannot clone a unknown quantum state. If you know that this is zero or this is one, you can use a sort of uh, CNOT gate to actually transfer the one to another ancillary bit. But if you don't know that what is the what what's the bit bit is, okay, you cannot copy that. So this this is the no cloning principle. So we cannot preserve or we cannot cannot preserve a preserve a quantum state, okay, which is not known to me, right? And we can use later. Okay, okay, cannot store it in the memory. The second one is that measurement itself is a source of error in the quantum state. So, so we have to do this very judiciously, right? You cannot, you cannot initiate measurement. Uh, okay, that means you have to think that if I measure at this point of time the quantum state, it will completely decohere. So we have to reinitialize the quantum system once again. Right, and there is a cost, and and you have to set up, the, and you have to also think in terms of the algorithmic perspective. The third part is that con continuum possible errors. So it, it is not that uh, that means the errors are errors are uh, disjoint. There may be there may be okay the errors which can combine the errors which can combine. And which can and which can have a continuum of errors, and that's very difficult to correct that also, because it's an influence of not only one type of error but in influence of of more than one types of error. So these are the these are the challenges, and this is called a noisy quantum system. So that's why the, we call that whether in this type of systems also we can do a good appreciable computing. Okay. So now we. Uh, now I give you a very, very, very brief, a very brief information about what are the simplest type of errors which can occur in a quantum system. Okay, so uh, so the uh, okay, so there are uh, majorly there are two types of errors. One is the bit flip error, and one is the phase flip error. Okay. Now these are called unitary errors because these have equivalent unitary functions. Okay, we know that what is a unitary function, right? Yeah, we know that what's a unitary function. So, so a unitary function is, is, is something, if we have a unitary function u, then what we can always have, we can, have, we can always have an u dagger, which is a conjugate transpose of u, and this u dot u dagger is a, okay, is a, is a, is a, uh, uh, Okay, is a what I can say is a uh, okay, u dot u dagger is an identity. Okay, now, you know, every quantum gate or quantum operation, right, on the principle of of this uh, okay, of the Hamiltonian. Uh, okay, they they are uh, they are unitary operators. Okay, so so the bit error is something that we operate a not operation or a or a sigma x, a poly x, a poly x gate, 
it's equivalent to a poly x gate operation on the qubit. So what it, what it does, it flips 0 to 1 and 1 to 0, so it's a bit error. Now, there is something called phase error also. So phase error means changes the phase, right? And this is a poly z operator, which is the phase gate. And this phase gate operates unwantedly or unknowingly in your quantum state. And from alpha uh, 0 plus beta 1, it becomes alpha 0 minus beta 1 after, after this phase error. So, so what you see is that there is, a, there is a complete change in the quantum state. And that is, and that affects our, our, our quantum algorithm, right? So, so we cannot tell that, okay, we cannot tell that, hey, our, our, our quantum error, uh, okay, doesn't, uh, doesn't have much influence on the quantum error algorithms. It has a heavy influence on the quantum algorithm. So, so if we don't, uh, okay, if we don't actually appreciably, uh, okay, correct this errors or, or in some way uh, uh, bypass these errors, okay, our algorithms will fail. Now, now obviously you can tell that, okay, there may be not, not a 180 degree phase change, but maybe the phase change may be in some sort of, some sort of other values. And we have found that we can all always represent those phase changes in a linear combination. So, so, so actually there is a, 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 a there is an error model that any single qubit error can be represented as a combination of of bit of phase flip and bit flip right and these are the, these are pretty standard okay now now if you can correct this correct this flip operations bit as as bit flip and phase flip uh, or whatever errors we can have is a combination of these if there is a way that we can correct this bit flip and phase flip we can correct those errors also. And that's what is the quantum error correction, okay? So there are circuits, there are circuits. That we, so, so what we need to do, we need to actually develop quantum error correcting codes. So what are those quantum error correcting codes? Quantum error correcting codes are those codes which can, uh, which can actually detect the syndrome. And based on the syndrome, whether it is a, it's a, it's a bit flip or a phase flip. This is a, this is a single qubit. I'm in the example given. It's a single qubit. So, so depending on the on the bit on the on the bit flip or phase flip, right? You can you can actually uh, correct that. Okay. So, so if you see this type of circuit, these are the standard uh, circuits which can correct the bit flip error, and these are standard circuits which can correct the phase flip errors. Now, now the more uh, that is the the better way to uh, to go with this is called an error error encoding technique, right? And there are several error encoding techniques like the short error encoding techniques, thin error encoding technique, which actually expands expands the quantum states using some redundant uh, bits qubits, right? And tries to and try. And this redundant qubits helps to detect you the syndrome that which particular bit position the that is if error has occurred, uh, the syndrome detector can actually identify which bit position the error has occurred, and it can significant it can now now do a okay now do okay can operate can operate on the state on the quantum state and can change the uh, uh, okay change the bit values and uh, qubit values and can and can and can again undo the errors. Okay, so so this is an error correction, error detection, and then error correction. So so if we see the Schwarz encoding, so Schwarz encoding is something like this. So so we actually okay, we actually encode it, encode up a, a pretty simple, a pretty simple alpha zero to alpha zero l, right, and 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 one to beta one n. And what is zero and what is uh, what is one l? Right, a zero is something which is defined as like this zero 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 by one one one, right? And 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 one L one L is something like this. And this is and this is three means this is actually multiplied in three three. Uh, okay, so so it's basically basically three times they okay, they are multiplied. So it will be actually zero 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 zero. Uh, okay, there will be nine terms in each of this each of this. Uh, 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 Okay, the, okay, is the, the entire quantum state, it will expand, okay? Right, so, so similarly, so once we encode this, 
Okay, once we encode this, okay, you see that it is expanded by three. So three, three, uh, yeah, yeah, three, uh, three, and three, nine. Okay, nine. Okay, it's expanded to nine bits. Okay. Now you know there are standard standard error correcting codes depending on the syndrome. Depending on the syndrome. Okay. Um, just just give me one second. Yeah, so yeah, sorry, I am in my office, so there was a, a short discussion. Okay, so uh, yeah, so, am I visible to all of you now? Uh, that, uh, my presentation, I think it's okay, right? Okay, so so this particular uh, okay, so this particular circuit, this particular circuit actually tells that the nine qubit code was, as I said, uh, okay, so. So each qubit is encoded, as I said, 0L and 1L, right? And 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 then it is called a concatenated code because it concatenates with your with your qubits. It's a it's an it's an expanded concatenated code, right? Right? And then and then the error correction, which are basically the sigma x and sigma z. Okay, okay, sigma x and sigma z corrections can be done with the particular circuit. Right, which particular short uh, okay short so so this is a sort of encoding. Uh, this is an error correction uh, circuit, right? And then you actually un 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 unroll this particular again once again, okay? To to get back to the to the initial set of psi, okay? So so psi is entangled with the with the error correcting code using these two uh, C not gets, and then and then we actually prepare this uh, for the syndrome detection. And then we detect the error, and then we do it. Okay, so this is the this is the this is the way how the how the error correcting codes work. And there are there are several uh, several example error correcting codes in the quantum domain. Okay. Uh, okay. Right. So. Uh, Okay, so so a quantum so a quantum error correction so quantum error correction is actually a sort of a sort of way we try to do is is a is a reputation code and we can use different types of uh, um, way to correct this particular errors. Okay, right, a bit flip or a face flip errors. Okay, uh, so. So I will just uh, skip this a bit. So now, now when we look into this very standard quantum error corrector, uh, correction codes, which are, as I said, there are Steen code, Laflame, uh, Shores, all these sort of things. And, and if you can include this particular codes, uh, okay, the Laflame code is, uh, gives you a five qubit code, uh, right? And, uh, and, then, and then the question is that how much resource you require, because for each qubit, you have to encode this with nine, seven, or five qubit, which is enormously increases the number of uh, uh, number of resources what we require because for each qubit, right? You have to dedicate this number of codes, uh, uh, this number of qubits. Okay. So, so one target in this particular activity, entire error correction activity, is that can we reduce the number of error correcting? Um, uh, the number of encoding bits in the correction. The the other one is that okay, can we can we reduce the error correction circuit? Because error correction circuit is also pretty heavy. Okay, so so error correction circuit can itself induce errors. Right. So this is also also a good activity in terms of research or in terms of how to how to plan your plan your quantum design. Uh, Okay, to a specific technology, right? right? So actually, actually, in one of our research, we have tried to work on this particular uh, uh, thought process that if we have a quantum algorithm, but right, there are different types of 
get the different types of uh, uh, ways we can implement the algorithm. And we have different types of technologies. And we have different types of quantum error correction code, right? This is this is still still a very open research problem. I, I still don't know how many how many how many uh, uh, okay research uh, research activities have been done in this domain. So so given an algorithm and given a technology, can we find can we find the best possible quantum error correcting code? What do we mean by this best possible quantum error correcting code? It means that whether it can reduce the number of encoding qubits because that is the real cost and whether it can also reduce the number of gate operations what we require in quantum error correction because this error correction minded this error correction is an overhead to your circuit both in terms of qubits and both in terms of the gates now because this is not required by your algorithm but you can't but you can't help it right Okay, you can't help it because, because because otherwise your algorithm algorithm will have error, right? You cannot you cannot have a good measurement. You cannot have a clean measured state outcome, right? So this is the this is the this is the philosophy of this of this of this quantum error correction. Okay. Now, now efforts has been taken efforts has been taken to reduce this. You can have you can have a lot of. Uh, uh, okay, uh, activities. Uh, okay, doing this. Some. Okay, okay, from error correction, it's not only technology. Also, also you have to also incorporate one other thing, which is called the quantum placement. So quantum placement is something which is which is uh, which is based on your on your actual architecture of your quantum system. So based on your quantum placement, also error encoding codes can be designed because. Some error encoding codes are better for a particular type of placement, and some error encoding codes are 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 for other type of placements. Okay, so so there are there are a lot of work. This is this is the work again from my uh, from a junior at Princeton, Chia Chun Lin, in two thousand fourteen. So so the, in his thesis, he proposed a very beautiful uh, quantum error correction. Uh, okay, it's algorithm. Right, and it is, as I said, it was technology specific. So, so we, so, so the thought process was that uh, where, where we will, uh, okay, use the technology input. The other, other thought process was that the other thought process was that where you do this error correction. So you can, you can, you can tell that, hey, I will do the error correction after each gate operation, but that is not a good option. Because that will increase your increase your cost enormously. So what you can do, you can actually try to work with an error threshold, right? And 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 when you see that your circuit, in that means your error, in gets gets higher than the error threshold, then you know that you have to inspect and you have to correct the error. So this is the approach which was started from this particular paper. And it's a still a good, quite a good approach, where instead of just judicially doing error correction after after each gate operation, which is very ideal, right? Because because after each gate operation, there can be an error. But but uh, but we cannot do that because if we do that, so then the problem is that then the, then we have then we have uh, okay enormous increase in the cost of the okay of this of this error. Okay, that's error correction and detection, error detection and correction. Okay, so so judiciously, can we think of a threshold? And okay, we uh, we generate a flow, okay, a process by which we can which can estimate the error after each gate operation, and once it gets over the threshold, we apply this. Okay, so this have shown a considerable reduction in this in this in this entire entire overhead in this quantum quantum error correction process. Okay, so. So what I will, I will go into the into the more the, the, the latest work what has been achieved by our group in this domain is called an intelligent quantum error reduction. Right now, what it is done, it has taken a machine learning approach, an offline machine learning approach. It's not an online, right? It's an offline machine learning approach, which means that, okay, which means that we have used the machine learning 
to understand the nature of the error in a specific technology, right, for the different benchmark circuits. And then we have uh, taken the features, features of the circuit in terms of the, of the number of qubits, the depth of the circuits, the gates which has been used in the circuit, right? And based on this feature space, we have tried to, uh, okay, try to, uh, try to estimate, uh, okay, the error of the circuit, okay? And we have found a very good formulation of that. Then what we have done, okay, for a given circuit, we have estimated the error if it is over a threshold, we have fragmented the circuit. Okay, we have fragmented the circuit and this, this error estimation is based on the machine learning policy. Okay, as I said, right? So, 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 so based on the number of qubits, based on the number of gates, based on the nature of the gates, what is being used, right? We can estimate or we can actually do a, uh, do a design time estimation of the error. Okay. And then if the error goes over a threshold, we fragment the circuit and we again, we estimate the error. And we go on fragmenting the circuit unless, unless this error is below a threshold based on our machine learning uh, structure. And then we, and then we, and then we execute this, uh, this, this fragmented circuits, right? And then we, again, we try to, to couple this, okay, couple this, couple this results or the outcomes in such a way so that we can have the entire, entire, entire evolution of the quantum system are captured. The other important problem in this algorithm is that we also follow a, a mean cut policy. So, so when we try to fragment the circuits, we are trying to see that, that, that this particular fragmentation results to the uh, uh, okay, minimum, the minimum cut between the two, two blocks of the circuit. Okay, so so this is the algorithm which has been done, and this is being very very well tested, and very the results are pretty good, right? And we have shown that we can reduce the 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 the, the quantum state fidelity has been enhanced, right? We we can able to able to map them in the modern NIS2 devices using the using the simulation as well as the physical physical execution using the the IBM IBM quantum hardware. And we have uh, shown that it reduces a significant amount of error, better fidelity, the 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 cost in terms of in, okay okay cost in terms of uh, uh, okay it's a uh, okay, it's a error 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 correction also also reduces. Only only the take uh, only the cost increases here is on the fragmenting the circuit, right? So fragmentation of the circuit incorporates the cost. And obviously, you require multiple copies of the hardware so that you can run this fragmented uh, fragmented circuits individually, and then you can again actually collapse the result into okay, into some form. So, so, so post processing of the circuits and pre processing of the of the circuits takes a little bit of cost, but but we have actually reduced the error significantly, okay, in the circuit, right? Using this using this multiple uh, multiple approaches. One part is machine learning. One part is fragmentation, right? And 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 uh, okay. And the other part is how to do the pre-processing and the post-processing very efficiently, right? You can look into this work which is being uh, which will come up, which is, which will come up uh, very soon in in the ACM transaction. It is being accepted in the ACM transaction of quantum engineering, and so so this is a new direction where we are hitting forward. Where we are, and we are, and that means I'm. I'm very hopeful that uh, that. Uh, ah, five minutes. So so uh, so I'm very hopeful that this uh, this can be again tested at the uh, okay at the CDAC end, uh, okay, and we will and we will try to uh, okay, try to see that how this can be plugged as a very uh, okay okay module in the. Right in the present libraries, but we have open open source libraries of the quantum the quantum uh, systems, and uh, so uh, so the next uh, there are some next steps also we are thinking about. We are we are thinking the partition a little bit better way. We are trying to uh, think some sort of uh, okay better graph graph algorithms to handle the partition, and and also in the error estimation also we are trying to 
in the in the machine learning also we are trying to uh, okay trying to focus on certain other features of the circuit uh, to expand the scope of the machine learning okay so so whatever the lectures i have given these are basically based on the on this uh, okay, on these publications uh, what has been done by, by my research group in the just in the couple of uh, okay i think in the past year okay past year and the present year it's a it, okay all of these are very new work what we have what i presented and so i'm very interested to uh, that the researchers in this particular group and the team from sidac uh, right that we can if we can exchange a lot of uh, a lot of thought process and IEEE is also so helping us in generating the knowledge development in this domain and i and i feel that uh, okay, feel that this is a, this is a really really this quantum uh, okay quantum domain is coming up in a great way in the in the research community in the student community in the industry community in the professional in the in the quantum electric in, in the computer and electrical engineers uh, so so i hope uh, this is a fantastic ecosystem and and if you want to connect me uh, further on this Okay, detailed discussions on this. I'm always readily available, uh, but due to the uh, time, I cannot extend my lecture further uh, because I have some again some work starting within five ten minutes. So, uh, so my lecture ends here, and and if you have any questions or uh, that means or you, or you want any type any any further discussions, okay, I am there available for you. Yeah. Uh, professor, there is one question. Sure. Uh, uh, a reference for the statement an arbitrary uh, rotation error can be expressed using linear combination of bit and phase flip error. Yeah. So a reference uh, is being asked by Ms. Jyoti. Okay. So yeah. So I will. Uh, that is, I will try to get the reference and send it to you. You, Dr. Jyoti, you can just you can just mail me. Uh, that means why that means I can I can give you the answer very conceptually. Uh, so the Pauli Pauli gate library, right, is something uh, which is a very universal library in the sense single qubit or single qubit universal library. Theoretically, theoretically, any transformation, any single qubit transformation can be represented by the Pauli gates. And so, and so, based on that assumption, right? You can you can always you can always uh, define any transformation in terms of uh, okay the linear combination of Pauli operations, right? The Pauli x and Pauli z, which are basically the uh, okay the bit and 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 the Pauli Pauli y will not come here because we are not doing on the x y operations. Okay, so 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 we are only only assuming that the errors influence the phase and the right and this and the and the and the okay the uh, the inversion of the amplitude only not else so this can be this can be conceptualized also theoretically but uh, but, uh, but i will uh, i will give you the reference so don't worry okay thank you yeah one more question mm -hmm. One more question, one second. Yeah, how much is circuit overhead for implementing quantum error correction techniques? Okay. Uh, this cannot be uh, said in a generic way. But it is quite high. So, so you can see that if we just go into the uh, very pretty standard quantum error correction, right? You need a large, large number of qubits for the concatenation codes, and you also require the the operations for correcting and detecting the error, detecting and correcting the errors, right? We have seen that if you if you tell in terms of qubits, right? Qubit 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 cost becomes at least 20 or 25 times okay if we incorporate this concatenated codes compared to the normal okay in terms of gate cost it is it is it is entirely dependent on the okay on the algorithm what we are doing but but uh, but, but for each each quantum error corrections you have at least some 
some 10, 10, 10, 10 operations to do, right? So, so at which stage you do this quantum error correction depends on how the quantum, uh, uh, okay, the cost of the of the error correction gets will come up. But but for the concatenation codes, the qubit <laughs> qubit cost comes up enormously. And the problem is that you cannot support those number of qubits also in the in the physical quantum machines. Okay, so that is a real bottleneck. Uh, okay, so uh, one more one more question from the same uh, person, uh, Mr. Gurmohan Singh. Do quantum errors depend on type of qubits used for realizing qubits? True, true. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, so I will say that quantum uh, we have experimented. Uh, that means we have got a good data from from industry when we worked at Princeton. And that was, I'm not disclosing that uh, that industry uh, that uh, the organization due to the confidentiality. Uh, they had they had given us a good amount of data, and we have seen that some of the technologies like 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 quantum dots, okay, they are very very high prone to error, right? And some of the technologies like quantum uh, like the the photonics, linear photonics, or or the ion traps, right? They are less prone to error, okay. Uh, uh, because because the because quantum fidelity is a sort of technology dependent. Okay, that means that, uh, that's why the good research problem is that given a quantum algorithm, given a quantum technology, what should be the best quantum error correction strategy? Yeah. Any question from the call? Okay. Uh, Thank you, Professor. It was a wonderful, uh, a quite a long uh, discussion uh, uh, from your side. And uh, we appreciate your uh, time and effort to uh, provide the, uh, deliver the lecture uh, for this bigger audience. Uh, thank you. And uh, I request all the uh, participants here to give him a big uh, round of applause. Thank you. Uh, thanks to SIDAC. Thanks to SIDAC Bangalore. Thanks to IEEE for hosting this. Right. And I hope that uh, this quantum, the quantum research community will grow in India. Okay. And, and I will be uh, very happy to stay connected with all of you. Thank you all. Thank you. Yes. Thank, thank you, Professor.